My name is Jenny, and I'm a wife and mom raising two kids. But I used to live a more glamorous life as a TV reporter. I was on the nightly news interviewing pop stars and politicians. So when I said goodbye to TV and hello to motherhood, I suddenly discovered what we moms are up against. We live in a world that tells us to be rich and famous, thin and successful. You know, almost nobody says, oh, oh hey, you're a mom? That's fabulous. But you are fabulous, and I'm here to tell you why. It's the Channel Mom Show, celebrating you with Jenny Dean Schmidt. Let's go out in a Welcome back to the Channel Mom Show, where we are celebrating you, Mom. Our next guest is going to tell you some things that will blow your parenting theories right out of the water. Ashley Merriman talks about these issues in her book, Nurture Shock, which she co-authored with Poe Bronson. The book is a New York Times bestseller, and apparently scientists are now using it in their own research. Ashley, by the way, has also been mentoring kids in inner city Los Angeles for the last 12 years, so she has a little bit of experience with children. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, thanks for being with us. And, and I've read your book, Nurture Shock, and <laughs> wow, I think a lot of people would be have all kinds of, of a range of emotions. You've been featured on ABC News and, and Good Morning America, Newsweek. You know, a lot of people have paid attention to this book, partly because it's got some controversial theories. And let's just dive right in. First of all, the praise problem. Really, you say that in America, we praise our kids too much or at least in the wrong way. Tell me about that. Well, I think it's both, actually. <laughs> you know, we all sort of, really since the 80s, that's when it sort of kicked off, have had this idea that we need to boost kids' self-esteem, and if we boost their self-esteem, then we boost their achievement along with it. But actually, it turns out that it's a, it's a one-way street. It's not a two-way street. Boosting kids' achievement helps their self-esteem. Boosting their self-esteem means they think to themselves, I'm so great, I don't need to work on anything. Mm -hmm. And praise, what we've especially been doing is what researcher Carol Dweck sort of calls person praise. We praise who they are, not what they do. Things like, oh, honey, you're so smart because you finished your homework. Mm -hmm. You're not smart because you finished your homework. You've finished your homework. But those kinds of things, what we're teaching kids when you hear, oh, so smart is that success is based on this innate skill, and you've either got it or you don't. Right. And, and, there, and her research basically showed that when they prayed certain children, th they tended not to want to uh, try the things that were more challenging. They sort of dumbed themselves down and mm -hmm. were afraid to try harder. And, in fact, it worked against achievement when you told a child that they were really smart. Yes, actually, kids in lab studies who've been constantly told they were smart were more likely to cheat, more likely to lie about grades. Because if I cheat, well, then I can say, well, I could have done it if I wanted to, but I just didn't care. So if I blew the test, it reflects badly on that guy, not me. Overpraised kids grew up to not be able to pick a college major because they don't, a couple years down the road after working at school, realize, hmm, I'm actually not that good at this. Mm -hmm. So they just don't want to commit to anything that actually is you know, a problem, you had mentioned, you know, is it too much praise? Kids today hear so much empty praise that they don't even believe it on face value after about the age of seven. By age 12, kids actually think hearing praise is a sign that things are wrong wow. and that grown-ups are worried about you. Because kids who do really well, we leave them alone. Kids who we think are struggling or might not be able to do it, those are the kids we say, oh, you're so smart, you're so great, you can do it. And it's sort of this cheerleading rah, rah, rah thing. And they understand that that means there's a problem. We're not fooling them yeah. when we give them this sort of empty praise. If anything, we're just sort of telling them we're not trustworthy opinions, don't listen to us. Well, and let's talk about lying. This leads right into lying. You say mm -hmm. that really they, they, they think pe their parents are lying to them. But well, they are, right? Really done. I, I mean, mean I, I would lie with my tutoring kids if they come in the room without falling down. I used to say, oh, honey, you're so smart. Yeah. Well, that's not true. They walked without falling down. Yeah. You know, so we are actually telling them, oh, my gosh, that's the prettiest picture ever. Oh, my gosh, you're such a genius. No, you're not. And the kids understand the sincerity, and they start thinking to themselves, hmm, lying is how you deal with a difficult social situation. Okay. okay. Lying is how I tell you what you want to hear 
and that makes things okay. Well, and what, and you also have an interesting chapter chapter about lying and kids, and it's sort mm-hmm. of you sort of say you really shouldn't be telling your kids that lying is bad in quite the way that you are because it's having a backfire effect. Tell me about that. Well, it's not that you shouldn't be telling kids lying is bad, but the problem is we all focus on lying and how severe the punishments are to it. That's the problem. Like, do you remember what happens to Pinocchio? Yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, we all remember his nose. nose. Do you remember after that? Uh, No, I don't. The the, the puppet who wants more than anything to be a human in a real family, because he lies, is sent to an island of orphans, and all of them become donkeys. That's okay. I'm right. Yeah, I remember that. Right? So what happens to the boy who cried wolf? Remember? He gets (laughs) caught. Well, no, 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 he believes him. him. Yes, no, he believes him. Yes, he gets eaten by wolves. Oh, does he? Oh my gosh, I've forgotten my entire childhood. <laughs> well, we all remember, like we don't remember the catastrophic part. We just remember right. the scary part on the way. Right. Because the other part's terrible. Right. So what we've taught kids is, if you lie, we will disclaim you from our family. We will abandon you, and maybe you're going to turn into an animal of some kind, or you'll be eaten by an animal. <laughs> This is the lesson. And what kids take away from this isn't don't lie, it's don't get caught. Because the severity of the punishment for getting caught is terrible. And when you think about this, right, a kid, you know, throws a ball in the house and breaks a window. If he lies, he tells you what he hears, there's a chance you might believe him. Mm -hmm. It was a meteor, Mom. I don't know. It was just this amazing thing. We should call the news. Mm Mm-hmm. If you, if you say no and you don't believe him, you punish him for breaking the window, there's probably no extra punishment for lying. So you may as well try and get away with it because there's no downside. Okay. Well, so, but, but lying is bad. So, of so, course. So how do we te- I mean, we can't give up on that. So how do we teach our kids not to lie? Well, I think the focus needs to be on the value of honesty. In fact, researchers like Victor Tal- uh, Victoria Talwar in Canada have found that when you tell kids the boy who cries wolf in lab experiments, they actually lie more. Mm-hmm. But if you tell them a story of George Washington, the father who says, I would rather have an honest son than a grove of cherry trees, then they actually start becoming more honest. Because what you've taught them isn't lie to me, tell me what I want to hear. It's what I want to hear is honesty. So tell me the truth. That makes me happy. When you tell kids it's about honesty, you've taken away that impetus to lie in the first place. Because what they were doing is they were lying to make you happy. They were telling you what you wanted to hear. So if you say it's honesty that's important, that changes the game for them. Sure, sure. And you have so many things in this book that I think would would blow people's minds. So, so we, we do want to have you back. But for instance, you say that, that so many people make the mistake of not talking to their children about race because they don't want them to see color, when mm-hmm. in fact that, that, again, backfires because they should be talking about race because they're sort of by default to the child thinks there's something wrong with being another color, um, you know, whether you're black, white, or yellow, whatever you are. They, they think if you're not mentioning it that by default you're sort of saying that's not okay. Uh, that's well, a I think what you're really saying is, This is such a toxic topic, we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. We can see difference, but we can't talk about it. You know, even if you think about reading a picture book with a young child, (gasps) look at the boy's shirt. It's, what color is it? That's right, it's red. What about the other kid? (gasps) That's right, it's blue. And you describe everything on the page except for the fact that one of the boys is brown and one of them is white. Even before kids can speak, they're starting to get a message. You can see this, but you have to pretend there's no difference. And don't talk to me about this. It doesn't mean kids don't recognize the difference. It means we as adults have told them, you can't ask me. Which means if they have questions, they just sort of fill in the answers on their own. Yeah. Or ask another kid on the playground. And the other kid on the playground is not the person we want talking about race and ethnicity. We want kids to talk to us about it. And right. if you have questions, that's fine. I will explain to you what it means. And, you know, what about teen rebellion and, and boredom? You've you got mm-hmm. some very interesting theories about this. And, and one reason I want to have you back is because my theory is that you cannot scientifically nail down love. 
And I think the love factor enters into all of this. And I think the parents are really trying to love and you can't take that away from them. So, so I'm curious about how that fits into all this, but, but, but right now I just want to focus on the teen rebellion and boredom thing and um, how teens are really wired to rebel. Well, you know, researchers, neuroscientists like Adriana Van Galvan at UCLA have found that actually teen brains work differently in terms of rewards and excitement. You know, a little kid's brain, they play video games in an fMRI, which is this big brain scanner. And a little kid's brain lights up at everything, pure joy, no matter how small or big the, the prize they're getting in their, gold, in their video game. Right? And you think about it, right? A four-year-old, honey, want a cookie? <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Honey, want a car? Woohoo! It's the same, ex- you know, glee, right? Sure, sure. An adult, it's proportionate. Do you want a cookie? Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Here, have a car. Yeah. Wow. I miss the old reactions, frankly. My kids are know, right? beyond that. Yeah, I miss those. But Adriana says that actually teens, their brain pattern is completely different, and it's actually the pattern of a seasoned drug addict, which is there's no response for a small reward. A medium reward actually drops in brain activity, as if you've actually lost rather than won the game. Yeah. And then when you get that big reward, you get this huge response. Mm-hmm. So I think that research sort of tells us that it really is difficult for teens to be engaged, to be motivated. They are perhaps biologically prone to be bored, and then they have to do something sort of radical to wake themselves up. Uh-huh. I mean, that is, so that I think is part of teen rebellion, but the most important part and it is actually that it doesn't even, teen rebellion doesn't actually peak as teens. We all sort of think it's this linear slope, you know, baby, you hold all day at two or three. Mommy put me down, mommy put me up. Yeah. And by 18, you're out of the house, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah. But that's not really the way it is. Teen rebellion peaks at 14. It's higher in an 11 or 12 year old than an 18 year old. Yeah, I'll testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what the really the engine behind teen rebellion is this need for autonomy to control my own destiny, and the problem then is when can they get that opportunity, and when do you feel comfortable giving it to them? An 11 or 12 year old, all they've really got is do I do homework before dinner or after? That's it. And these are small differences which sort of blow way out of proportion because your 18-year-old would say, well, I'm going to college or I'm not going to college or I'm getting a major or I'm getting a job. And you're actually okay with these decisions and the ability to make them, whereas that young you know, preteen is fighting for every decision he gets to make and there really aren't that many. Yeah. So that's where the real tension in teen rebellion comes from. Yeah, we, we need to pick places to give them autonomy to reduce some of that feeling that we don't trust them, that they don't have autonomy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, you know, you may have a 14-year-old or even an 11-year-old boy who says, I can't play soccer anymore. I hate it. I'm bored. Yeah, my my husband would agree with that. Well, he's been playing soccer since before he can remember, right? Four or five. And the good news is, if you play soccer this year, you can play it next year and next year and the year after that, and maybe someday you'll go to college and play soccer there. You say, oh, my God, my whole life is soccer. Why? It's always the same. So for that kid who's bored, you know, you might want to find out why. Why doesn't he want to go to soccer? Maybe he had a fight with a friend on the team and he's just sort of trying to avoid the social situation. But maybe it really is that profound sense of I'm just in Groundhog's Day Make it stop. Yeah. And if that's the case, then you can say, you know, I completely agree. I understand your board. Did you know that the Pee Wee League needs a junior coach? Why don't you help those kids? Now he's actually going to be responsible for something. He's going to be planning strategy. Sure. He'll still be running those drills. He'll still be out on the field getting exercise. But he has this feeling that people are trusting me and relying on me, and I get to step up. And, and tell people what I think, and they're going to have to listen to me. They'll be four, but they're going to listen to me. Sure, sure. And it gives them a kind of autonomy. I, you know, I, I would really love to have you back, Ashley, because I imagine we could have a, a few debates about some of these things. I might not agree with every last theory, but you've got some great ones. Um, you. Will you come back and see us? Sure. And what's your contact information so people can get a hold of you? Um, the easiest thing to do is to find me at nurtureshock.com. 
Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much for being with us today, Ashley. Thank you. You're listening to the Channel Mom Show, where we are celebrating you on Mile High Sports Radio, AM 1510, FM 93.7. I am Jenny Dean Schmidt. Thank you so much for joining us today, and have a great week. Yeah.